Prime Minister, it's wonderful to meet you, but under such sad circumstances, of course. How did you hear the news that the Queen had passed away? Well, of course, in uh, New Zealand, it was it was in the very early hours of the morning that the that the Queen had passed. Um, it, as protocol would dictate, it was um, the Cabinet Secretary in New Zealand that that uh, undertook to contact me. Um, but of course, because it was before five o'clock in the morning, uh, they needed they needed to to wake me to share the news, and they did that via the police who were stationed at the bottom of Premier House, and so it was by via a police officer and torchlight um, that I heard. They of course didn't themselves break the news, but as soon as they said, "Ma'am, the Cabinet Secretary would like to speak with you." that was enough to tell me what had happened. Because you were very aware that there were concerns about her health, of course. Yes, and also there's, to be honest, there's, there's no other reason for which the Cabinet Secretary would, would seek to, to reach out to me. Um, but it's their, their duty, that particular job. Uh, it was only the night prior that I'd been reading, uh, and just before I switched my light out, I was reading the news of, of her house. Uh, and, and hoping, as I know many, many others were, that, um, that she would rally. So I was deeply saddened. It is a, a, an extraordinary thing that there is such shock, mm. isn't there? certainly in this country, and I, I'm just wondering what the reaction has been in New Zealand. Oh, I think that sentiment is very similar. Um, at home, there's almost a sense, because the, the Queen represented such continuity for us, you know, so much has changed during her reign. Uh, the world has changed. You know, the way that we live and, and work and conduct our lives has changed, but she's just been this, this constant. So I think that there's almost a sense with her loss um, that, yes, it is a shock because I think it feels like something greater has been lost, her and that sense of continuity. And she was a great friend to New Zealand, of course, um, head of state, of course, but she was clearly very, very fond. She visited, I think, 10 times. That's correct. You know, I think, um, I think, what, I believe it may have been Prince William, Prince of Wales, who may have described her as, as everybody's grandma. Uh, I think probably New Zealanders would feel that sense of, uh, of connection uh, and familiarity. She visited many, many times, but she also, has been present for us through times of, of great sadness as well. I, I wonder almost whether or not that was anchored by that very first um, visit in the early 1950s. And it was, a, it was a, a great length of time was spent on that particular tour, but she was in New Zealand when the Tangiwai disaster occurred, a disaster uh, that, that took more than 150 lives. Uh, and to be present in New Zealand during one of our greatest tragedies, uh, I think really, uh, really cemented that, that connection that New Zealand had with her. It was, of course, I believe, the first place she did an overseas broadcast at Christmas uh, was from New Zealand. So there is a real link, isn't there? There is. So a sense of loss today, mm, yes, of course, and but also a sense of having to look forward. Mm. And I know you're going to meet the new king yes. while you're here. Yes, yes, I will be. I will be meeting um, King Charles, and of course, uh, he has already a strong connection to New Zealand as well, and New Zealand knows him well. Uh, and so you're right. It is. It is with sadness and gratitude that we acknowledge um, the loss of Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth, but also acknowledge King Charles. I know that you have a great warmth for her personally, mm. and you met her, didn't mm. you? What did you talk about? What are your memories of meeting the Queen? I think the thing that stood out for me, of course, it was I was, I was very nervous and anxious to meet the Queen. And, you know, in the back of my mind, there were all the protocols. And, and of course, in, in New Zealand, perhaps we, we, we don't have so many of, of, um, of those or in too many circumstances. Uh, and so I, was, I remember feeling very determined to get it Right, but as soon as I walked into the room, I forgot everything that I was meant to be doing. But she still had a way of putting you at absolute ease. And, and I think this thing that stood out to me was just in a conversation, you were having just that, a conversation. She knew New Zealand so intimately that she could, uh, she could pick up on, on current news and events. She knew what was happening at home. She asked uh, questions in a level of detail that showed me she was keeping a very, a very close eye on affairs. Um, but at the same time, she was also a mum and she was a grandmum. And so I asked her a few, I just asked her um, uh, a little bit about life and including during lockdown. And she was always very forthcoming. Mm. 
you, you famously had a, a baby dur- while you were in office. Did you discuss the idea of combining leadership and motherhood? Do you know, actually, the, the conversations that I remember uh, the most actually were rather during COVID, COVID lockdown. That, that, those were the ones that really, and it was probably because those were the ones that weren't my first meeting. It was my second or third conversation with her. And uh, one of the conversations I remember is we were talking about this idea of not being able to to leave our homes and uh, and just you know the the impact that the pandemic was having. And she relayed to me that she had been listening to um, a radio interview with a political uh, prisoner, someone who had been confined to a very very small space for prolonged periods of time, years. And in retelling the story and likening it to, you know, a, a much greater and more difficult experience than what we were all going through, she said she listened to that story and she said it made one feel very small. And I, I, I think about that a lot, you know, the fact that um, for all her life and her experiences, the fact that she could still uh, hear the experience of others and hold such great empathy for them and relative to her own, just feel that there were there were others who were just going through such grave circumstances all the time and, and how that makes everyone else rel- feel relative to them. She was a very thoughtful person and this was in the middle of, of lockdown and she was still very contemplative about those circumstances. Mm. British Prime Ministers talk very fondly of the audiences they had yes. with her and the advice and the historical context she was able to give them because of the sheer amount of time she'd been on the throne. Did you get advice from her? I think probably the nature of um, the interactions were because they were more sporadic for, for I imagine, realm nations. They tended to be more focused on the issues of, of the day. But then at the same time, she would ask, she would ask after um, different communities and, you know, after the Christchurch and all of the experiences that uh, the community had there with earthquakes and, and a domestic terror attack. And so she would, she would ask about a range of different people and communities. Uh, I imagine if you were able to have more frequent audiences, that would be one of the benefits of that, that you could have those more consistent conversations. But my takeaway was that for us, she was less on the day to day, more bringing heart to just and care for, for how we were. The fact that during COVID we spoke twice, you know, she's just checking in, seeing that we were doing okay. It, it really did feel like someone was looking out for you. When she came to the throne mm. in 1952, mm. it was a very different world, as, as you yeah. have already said. And she was pretty unique yes. as, as a woman yes. in that position of leadership when women were yeah. back then in a much more secondary role. Yes. Did you or would you have looked to her for an example mm. in the way to lead as yes. a woman? I, I feel very lucky in the sense that I've grown up uh, never knowing anything other than a, a queen uh, and also uh, in New Zealand's case having uh, not one but two female prime ministers that have gone before me. I've said before I, I there was nothing ever that suggested to me that I couldn't be a woman in leadership because I was a woman. And, and I do put that down collectively to the fact that there were all those role models uh, around me, some at f- a further distance than other, but nonetheless role models. When I think about though a life in leadership and a life in service, of service, uh, it's hard to look past the Queen because of course politicians, we come and go, we're, we're there at, uh, at, at the will of the people. Um, I know that for however long I'm in politics, there'll be a time when I'm not. And in some ways you can think about how then you'll be able to spend more time with your family in particular. Her, her service was a constant. And uh, I have n- no doubt in my mind that she sacrificed a huge amount to do that. Just thinking about traveling, the sheer time taken to come and visit us in New Zealand in 1953 uh, and being a mother, uh, I, I can't imagine what that took. Mm. Looking forward, you have said previously that you wouldn't be surprised if New Zealand became a republic in your lifetime, Mm. but you said you've never sensed any urgency. What do you think will happen? Will things change now? 
Um, uh, you know, in, in my mind, uh, the sentiment uh, in New Zealand um, has been fairly, fairly consistent in this regard. Um, uh, for us, it's a very, it's a very complex consideration, and I've never sensed uh, there is an urgency for that debate or conversation. Um, but I do believe there will be a natural evolution over over time. And I think Her Majesty, um, uh, I think Her Majesty would have sensed or accepted that over over time as well. Um, but it's not something that's not something that I believe is in our immediate or near term future. And so now we have King Charles. Yes. And how do you think he will be or is being received by the New Zealand people? He's already known to us. He's a a friendly and familiar face who shares a passion for things that New Zealanders are passionate about. We're passionate about our our land, our environment, the place we're blessed to call home. We're worried about the future of all of those things. He understands us well um, and so it's not a matter of getting to know one another. Perhaps it's a matter of just seeing each other a little more often. And looking forward over the next few days you're going to the lying in state, yes. I understand. You'll then, of course, be going to the funeral. Mm. And this is a massive state occasion mm. in London. How does it feel to be here and in the UK at this time? My point of reference, I, I lived um, here in London for several years in my, in my 20s. Uh, so I know what the hustle and bustle of London usually looks and feels like. Um, from from the moment we arrived, you can sense and see see the difference here. It's a it's a, it's a nation that is has um, noticeably and rightly so uh, stopped and taken pause and reflecting um, and mourning, uh, and and you can see that everywhere. Uh, but it was an extraordinary life of service, and it deserves no less. Prime Minister, thank you. Thank you.